I'm going to make an introduction for Kurt this morning. I've had more people in the past couple months saying, who's the associate pastor here? And I say, Kurt Neely, which one is he? It's like, they don't even know who the associate is. So I called uh, Kurt up and I asked Kurt, I says, Kurt, would, would you preach on Sunday? Uh, they want to hear you preach. They want to know who you are. And Kurt is one of these, he is the nice guy in the congregation. He's just always the nice guy. Okay, um, Kurt and I play good cop, bad cop in counseling. And so they come into my office. They're there for about 10 minutes until they cry. And then normally I send them to Kurt. And Kurt is the soothing guy. So we took a picture of Kurt, and he didn't know we actually got this picture of him. So we took a picture of Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> and that is basically who he is. <laughs> <laughs> so we took a picture of him and just wanted you to know his real heart here and and he's just so humble and this is the balanced team although we figured out our whole staff that we have usually we really need a more balanced team because our hearts are all so um, we're just we're actually all a bunch of softies is what we are but so I'm going to introduce uh, Kurt and I want him to come up and he has a word from the Lord for you and he's a great man. I've known him for 40, 45 years or better. <laughs> Hopefully this is working. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, we come before you with humble hearts, Lord. We desire to enter into your presence. We desire to hear from you, Lord, through your Holy Spirit and your precious word. Lord, we realize that we can't do anything of any eternal value unless you are behind it. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be with us today, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church today. Lord, we lift up the persecuted church throughout the world. Lord, there's so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ that are suffering terribly right now. Lord, we pray that you give them the strength to never waver, to never deny your name, but to stand strong in the faith. Lord, we ask that you would be with our, our nation. We're going to talk about our nation today, and we're going to talk about revival. But Lord, our nation is in desperate straits. We need you so desperately, Lord. We ask that you would somehow intervene in a mighty and miraculous way to turn our hearts back to you. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so I decided this year that I would coach basketball. <laughs> oh, I haven't coached basketball since I was in high school at the Church of God. And I was, I believe, 16 years old, and I was coaching the little tykes. <clears throat> and some of those little tykes were named Dubois. And so I, I coached the boys in this family, and I noticed there was this little girl who at that time was eight years old. And, but she was just kind of in the background, kind of quiet. And... Um, I didn't really pay much attention to her until 10 years later when she was 18. And I saw her, and I'm like, Lord, I want to marry her. <laughs> and I did. It took me four years to convince her. But, but anyway, I started coaching basketball, and um, I'm a pretty loud coach. I didn't realize this, but I, I coach while they're playing the game. So I kind of thrashed my vo voice yesterday. I coached um, two games, one for Shiloh, my, my youngest son, and one for Greta, my daughter, my youngest daughter. Um, so it was a lot of fun. I'm in really enjoying it, but man, I really overdid it. <laughs> so hopefully I can get through this OK. So I want to, I've entitled this message, the path to revival in America. And we've been um, 
We've been talking about revival in the church for decades. As long as I can remember, since I was a wee little boy, and according to my mom and my grandparents, way before that, we've been talking about how to ignite revival in America, and America's church. Now, before I get into this, I want to I want to talk a little bit about something that is a prerequisite to revival that I'm really not going to go in depth on because it's a whole topic in itself. But there has never been a revival anywhere in the world that didn't wasn't preceded by a prayer movement. Prayer, intense intercessory prayer has always preceded every revival. And I believe it's preceding this one as well. I see people that are being called to deep intercessory prayer. I feel it in my own heart. I know many others that are sensing we've got to do something and it starts on our knees. And so if you are feeling that same calling, there are people that, are, that want to pray with you. Um, I don't know if you know the Patties um, lesson, Benita Patty, but I know they are, uh, Les does our prayer chain. He's the one in charge of that. So if you, if you send in a prayer request onto the prayer chain, he sends it out to the prayer warriors. I think there's like 20, 28 people on that prayer chain. Very confidential. They have sealed lips, but they have a direct line to the throne of God. And so they pray for you. And I know the Lord has, has been really um, stirring something up in their hearts that we need corporate prayer. We need individual prayer. That We need to do something to turn this nation around, and it starts with prayer. So I don't want to discount that at all, even though I'm not going to go into great depth about it today. I'm going to talk about paths that lead to revival things that we can actively do and ask the Lord to change in our hearts that lead to true revival, a true radical change in our own hearts and therefore in our communities and our states and our nation. So over the years we have sensed a lacking and a falling away in our churches and in our nation. We have longed for an intimacy with our Heavenly Father, and a unity and love with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But these precious moments of clarity and commitment are few and far between. Scripture warns us that a day would come when people would not tolerate sound doctrine, and they would call evil things good, and good things would be labeled evil. In Jeremiah... 1815, the weeping prophet laments. Jeremiah 1815. <clears throat> he starts out, Because my people hath forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up. Or as the New King James Version puts it, a way that is not a highway. Then if we turn over into Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 through 10, it speaks of this highway. It says, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men. Those fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, 
and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. From these two passages, from two completely different prophets, we can gain a lot of insight on what leads to apostasy in a nation or the church, and then how revival can lead back to vibrant relationship with God, with the God of the universe. We could spend a great deal of time talking about the first two failings listed by Jeremiah the prophet. Our forgetfulness about our loving creator. And secondly, vain worship of worthless things. These were the issues of the Israelites and they are huge issues in the American church today. We have forgotten our God and we have turned to multitudes of idols. But today I want to concentrate on these seemingly mysterious ancient pathways that lead to a glorious highway of holiness. According to this passage, the Israelites stumbled away from the ancient paths onto some other destructive paths that led them away from the glorious highway. The Bible has a tremendous amount to say about paths. One of our most beloved chapters in scripture is Psalm 23, and it says, Our good shepherd leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 25 says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Proverbs 3, 6 says that if we acknowledge the Lord in all our ways, he will direct our paths. But scripture also warns that there are those who will leave the ancient righteous paths and will refuse to get back on. In Jeremiah 6.16 it says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Here is where we find much of our nation and church today. Either not knowing the right way or knowing it, but refusing to get on the ancient path of righteousness. I want to deal today with the unknowing by shedding some light and clarity on what exactly these ancient paths are. The nature of a path is that it leads you somewhere and generally, when you travel on a path, we are hoping it will take us to somewhere we want to go. Usually, there is some reward for following that particular path, like a stunning alpine lake socked full of hungry cutthroat trout. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> or a peak with an incredible view, or maybe wildlife of some sort. This is true of God's ancient paths as well. They lead to something Im immensely good and wonderful. But what are these paths? On the other side of the coin, there are paths that lead to bad things. With, er with very strong words, Solomon warns in Proverbs 7 that young men should beware the path that leads to the house of the seductress. He says, let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Even in the ancient book of Job, <clears throat> it warns about the path of the ungodly. Job 6.18 says, The paths of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish. Proverbs 2.13 says, Who leave the path of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. 
In short, there are paths that lead up and there are paths that lead down. Some lead to the glorious highway of freedom in Christ and others to the dungeons of bondage to sin. Yes, in many ways, I think we have, like the Israelites, abandoned the ancient ways that have worked for literally millennia and have embraced paths that seem right, but they lead to destruction. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So I would like to explore with you a few of these ancient paths of righteousness. But I would like to, you th to think not only how these paths affect us personally, because they definitely do, but also in this critical time when we as a nation are selecting leaders who could radically change the way and very nature of our country. I propose to you a vetting process for those who seek office. Ask yourself, how well have they walked these ancient paths? The first ancient path that I want to talk about is one of the most important words in Scripture. It's called submission. Noah Webster defines submission like this. Obedience. Compliance with the commands or laws of a superior. Submission of children to their parents is an indispensable duty. Also, resignation, a yielding of one's will to the will or appointment of a superior without murmuring. Entire and cheerful submission to the will of God is a Christian duty of prime excellence. Of course, that's from Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. I love that dictionary because it uses the Bible to define words. <clears throat> I was first blessed to be an employer when I was 23 years of age. And I operated two restaurants and a motel in the gateway to the Blue Mountains, Dayton, Washington. At that time, I managed mostly people who were older than me. And surprisingly, they submitted to my authority as one of the owners and the manager. However, as I have grown older and my employees have grown younger, the ancient path of submission is increasingly less traveled. <coughs> I have also witnessed on many occasions the decay of submission in the home, which leads to disastrous results. Paul warned young Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. He said, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Listen to these words. They shall be lovers of them own, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now let's pause for a minute and reflect on this passage in light of our current leadership and even some of the candidates that are running for the highest office in the land. Can we vet some of our candidates and leaders using God's word? Absolutely we can. We should. We're Christians. Unless, unless 
We buy into the lie that a man or woman's character has no bearing on their leadership abilities. That's a lie. That's a bunch of hogwash. To me, character is the most important thing. You can learn the other stuff. You can learn a tremendous amount in a short amount of time. Character is what matters. Submission is mandatory in God's kingdom. God's whole design and authority is predicated upon submission. We see this most clearly when God the Son, Jesus Christ, submits to his Father's will in the Garden of Gethsemane. Time and time again, he begged his Heavenly Father that this cup would pass from him. But he always ended his prayer, not my will, but thy will be done. That's true submission. In the same way, it must be a part of the Christian home. In Colossians 3, 18 through 25, it starts, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in single, singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye, see, ye, ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respecter of persons. No respect of persons. So we see that submission is part of God's kingdom. And the Christian home as well as our workplace but how does it fit into our form of government? The Apostle Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter 13 that we are, not, that we are to submit to government authorities, that they are placed over us because there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exi exist are appointed by God. That is incredibly disturbing. <laughs> But it is the truth. In other words, we get the leaders we deserve. It is also true, though, that in our unique form of government, our forefathers designed it so that the authorities must submit to the will of the people. They designed it to be of the people, by the people, and for the people. You see, our founding fathers were gifted. I believe by God, to see the potential abuses of power and authority in our system. And they designed an, designed an amazingly simple yet effective series of checks and balances that forced the three branches of government to submit to each other and ultimately to the people they serve. They, they created a short but strikingly thorough document in our Constitution designed to ensure the leaders could not be corrupted by money, power, or influence. One of the ways they accomplished this lofty goal is to design a federal government that could not dole out favors or charity. They knew once the government crossed that line, it would be abused and would create a ruling wealthy elite class very similar to the corrupt English king they had fought so hard to rid themselves of. Tragically, over the years, we have drifted from the Founding Fathers' original intent and allowed it to be reinterpreted to fit the ruling class's desire for more control, more power, more wealth, and more influence. And they refused to submit to the will of the people. 
So we have arrived at a crossroads. The apple cart is being upended. And a kind of revolution is underfoot. We, the people in both parties, are fed up with the establishment and are flooding to the so-called outsiders in hopes of breaking up the political elite. It is a noble cause and desperately needed, but we must be sober-minded about it. Or we may find ourselves further from the Constitution rather than closer. The second thing I want to talk about is integrity. Noah Webster describes integrity this way. The entire unimpaired state of anything, particularly of the mind, moral soundness or purity, incorruptness, uprightness, honesty, integrity comprehends the whole moral character, but has a special reference to uprightness in mutual dealings, transfers of property, and agencies for others. In this ancient pathway, we find a character quality that encompasses so very much. Moral soundness, I think, best sums it up. If a person is morally sound, they cannot be corrupted. It has become a part of their being. Let me tell you from experience in the business world, it is difficult to find men and women who exhibit this rare quality. It is even more rare in the political realm, but so desperately needed. In my mind, this is one of the most important qualities a leader should have. Economics, foreign policy, negotiating treaties, and trade deals, all these things can be learned. But integrity must be a part of a person's character. A lot of times you can really get a vivid picture of what a word means when you look at the antonyms, the opposites. The antonyms of integrity are dishonesty, inequity, partiality, unlawfulness, untruth, favoritism, injustice, unfairness, unreasonableness, and wrong. This particular ancient path is becoming increasingly, increasingly rare. It seems most people put in the, just the wrong circumstances will cave. And we see that time and time again as we elect leaders that say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to accomplish this. And then they get into the pressures of the ruling class and they cave time and time again. There are a few exceptions. Praise the Lord. The next thing I want to talk about is charity. Charity, in a general sense, love, benevolence, goodwill, that disposition of heart which inclines men to think favorably of their fellow men and to do them good. In a theological sense, it includes supreme love to God and, un and universal goodwill to men. Liberality to the poor, consisting in almsgiving or benefactions or in gratuitous services to relieve them in distress. Charity is a beautiful thing. Benevolence is a beautiful thing. These, this is one of the ancient paths. We as Christians must be benevolent. We must have giving hearts. We must be the most generous people on earth. 
How can we withhold when the Lord has given us so very much? How can we possibly be stingy when we have all the riches of heaven at our disposal? How can we possibly go there in our minds? And yet we do. Now I want to talk a little bit about charitable giving. Um, we don't talk about this much at all in our church. In fact, I think I'm the only one that does. <laughs> Maybe John. <laughs> but charitable giving is the most beautiful thing and the Lord gives us promises. He says that if we are generous and we give and we tithe and we, we are free, freely release what the Lord has entrusted to us, then he's going to open the floodgates of heaven and he's going to pour out so much blessing that we can't even hold it. I have experienced that so many times over. Unbelievable. Unbelievable how we can be so desperately poor and, and feel like it, there's no way we can hold on. But we keep giving. We keep giving. And we trust the Lord with our finances. And time and time again, he has miraculously intervened. It's incredible. God can't break his promises, people. He can't break his promises. He's a promise keeper. He's not a promise breaker. So when we give charitably and we give from our hearts and we're cheerful givers, he's just waiting to just bless our socks off. And he does. That doesn't mean you're going to be the wealthiest man in town. No. But it means you're going to have everything you need and more. And then what do you do? You just give more. So I encourage... I know, um, you know, we talk about this in the board meeting, the size of our church and everything, that our, our monthly tithes should be higher for the number of people. And we realize that the people that we serve, a lot of, a lot of our congregation are unemployed and struggling to get back into society. Um, they've graduated from the, the ranches and they're trying to get on their feet again. And, and so we don't have the giving levels that other churches have. But you know what? The Lord provides for us month after month after month in abundance. And it, corporately as a church, we continue to give more and more, bring in additional staff, and the Lord continues to, to bless us with what we need. We're, not, we're certainly not a wealthy church. We need to, to pave our, resurface our, our parking lot. It's in pretty rough shape. So we're going to be doing a fundraiser for that. But um, we have needs. We have things that we, we really need to do in our church. But we just pray and patiently wait, and the Lord provides it time and time again. So it's, a, it's an amazing dynamic. But let me, let me give you a principle. This is an ancient path, okay? This is an ancient path. Charity is our responsibility. It's our responsibility individually, and it's our responsibility as a church. It is not the responsibility of government. It is not government's responsibility. Now, I've talked about this on two different occasions, how um, politicians will say um, welfare is, is biblical because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive, right? Very powerful statement, absolutely true. If I, if I give to someone, I end up more blessed than the person that just got what I gave. I end up way more blessed. It's like, that is amazing. The pie gets bigger. I may, not, I may be short whatever I gave, but there's something else that I get, Right? The Lord blesses you. The Lord pours out his, his blessings. So definitely, as I, as I give, and all of you give, you, you get more blessing bestowed upon you, poured upon you. That's a tremendous principle. 
amazing, wonderful principle. More blessed to give than to receive. Okay. Does that apply to government? No, it doesn't. Because the government doesn't produce anything. The only way it can produce something, the only way it can get money is to take it from you or print it or borrow it. That's the only way they can get it. So, in order to, to give to someone else, they have to extract money from you. They have to plunder you. They have to tax you in order to give it to someone else. And that creates something just the opposite of what Jesus taught us. It creates a system based on taking or plunder and entitlement over here. And instead of freeing people from poverty like giving and receiving does, it enslaves people in poverty. One of the, the great tragedies of our time is that many, many minorities are enslaved in entitlement right now. They cannot get out. The government, instead of helping them out like they originally said that they would do when Lyndon Johnson said, I can fix this. We can eliminate poverty, $11 billion, and we can wipe out poverty in America. Has that happened? Trillions of dollars later? It does not work. And yet so many Christians are, being, are buying into the lie that the solution to poverty is government has to fix it. No, 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 no. It only worsens the problem. It's based on taking an entitlement instead of giving and receiving. That has to come out of the government's hands and into the people's hands. And then you'll see an amazing lift. An amazing lift out of poverty. So, a very important truth there. Charity is, is our responsibility. Now, I, I do realize that a lot of people are thinking, I don't want that responsibility. I realize that. I understand. That's part of what's gone wrong is we've, we've relegated that task to the government. And so we can, without, with a clear conscience, we can turn from those in need and say, they have programs for that. They have programs that handle that. That's not the way it was supposed to be. That's not the way it was in the beginning of this nation. Neighbor help neighbor. Tragically, we hardly know our neighbors anymore. We don't know if they're in need. We've, we've so diminished that community feeling and that oneness that, that we should feel for our neighbors. Okay, I've got several more, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close there. I have eight that um, I want to get into, so we'll continue this another time. Um, but in closing, I want to go back to the first passage, that, or the second passage that we read in Isaiah. And I want, to, I want to talk to you about these, these ancient paths. They're beautiful paths. And, of course, they lead to this highway of holiness that's described that we're going to read right here. Um, and it may seem a little overwhelming. Well, I can't be that kind of person, especially if you've struggled with integrity, if you've struggled with honesty, if you've struggled with sin in your life, as all of us have. Then you may think this... This is beyond what I can do. I can't be this kind of person. And amen, you can't. Until something amazing happens to you. Until you're born again. Until you have that transformation where the Holy Spirit transforms your heart, takes out a heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh that's moldable, soft, malleable in the Lord's hands. And when that happens, he also empowers you with his very spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. 
we become the temples of the Holy Spirit. And in that amazing transaction, you suddenly have the power to be this kind of a person and to walk these amazing ancient paths. You can be a man and woman of integrity. You can be a man and woman who freely submits. You can be a man and woman of great generosity. It becomes your nature because you have the nature of God inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit. It becomes a part of who you are. So I want to read this last passage and then we're going to pray. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion, no ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there. It's a safe way. But the redeemed shall walk. The redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Hallelujah. That's an amazing highway and it's paved for us. Jesus said, the way to our eternal life is a narrow way. It's a beautiful way, it's a safe way, but it's narrow and only a few people find it. But the way to destruction is broad and many go in thereby. I'm asking everyone in this room to find that narrow way. Find that narrow gate. It's the only thing that leads to eternal life. The world will tell you, oh, there's lots of ways to eternal life. There's many paths. There's only one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by Jesus. He is the only way. I encourage you to enter through that gate and then walk those righteous, ancient paths. In this day and age, Old stuff is considered taboo. That we need to move ahead and be progressive and all these exciting things ahead and push all that, that old stuff away. It's no good. Not true. Not true. We have traditions. We have the ancient paths that are beautiful and they lead to a glorious road and a glorious place. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we can study your word. Lord, we do humble ourselves before you and we cry out to you, Lord, because we have sinned. We have fallen error in so many ways. And Lord, we've believed things that, we, that our culture told us and we thought that we were, we were okay. We believed that we could, we could go out and and fornicate and have as many partners as we want because the culture said, yes, that's okay. We, we've experienced a sexual revolution. We don't have to, we can push off those things that the, the church has told us all these years. And we've, we've done that, Lord. We've bought into the lie. In so many other areas, we've done the same thing, Lord. We've, We've decided it's okay to tell a lie. There's good times. There's times when we can tell a lie. And, and that if it serves our purposes, then yes, we should. And our leaders freely, freely lie. Right to our faces. And yet, we don't stand up and call them to account. What does that say about us, Lord? Lord, we're concerned. We're worried. And yet, we trust you. So, Lord, we ask that you'd intervene in our lives right now, Lord. That you would change us, that you would make us more like you, that you would cause us to walk those 
ancient paths, that you would direct our steps as you promised, that we would be righteous people, that we would be, even though we're a fool, we would walk that highway of holiness, that the devil couldn't get us there. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our names are written in your book. Lord, we long for that. We long for revival. We long for that burning ember in our hearts that draws closer and closer and closer to you. We love you, Lord. Use us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here, you guys. Love you very much. Have a great week. Preach the gospel. <laughs>